Hello, everyone. Welcome to the event tonight, Transition During a Pandemic. First of all, if you haven't heard about the Dean's Leadership Circle, we are a select group of business leaders with a commitment to the value and growth of the Mirage School of Business. And we work really hard to advance the vision of the Dean, and we play a crucial role in elevating the school through our leadership, mentorship, and community impact. Today's event is organized out of our commitment to add value to the student and alumni body. My name is Laura Wang, the DLC Young Alumni Chair, one of the organizers of this event. Also part of the organizers are Sandy, Yvette, and uh, Jasleen, who work at the school. So thank you so much for all your help in organizing the event today. Uh, for myself, I'm a full-time graduate from 2017, and I currently work as a consultant for Fortune 500 companies on cultural transformation and breakthrough results. I'm really pleased to introduce the speaker for our new graduates toast uh, today, Diana Ramos. Dr. Ramos is a board certified OBGYN adjunct clinical professor at the USC School of Medicine and public health medical officer for the California Department of Public Health. She graduated from the EMBA program in 2020, and she was this year's commencement speaker. As a student, Dr. Ramos invented and developed a video game designed for teens that screens for signs of depression. And her app won the UCI Shark Tank competition and was selected as a participant for the UCI Wayfinder Incubator programs. As Dean Ian Williamson says, Diana Ramos continues to make an impact at Mirage through her involvement with the DLC and her achievements as a physician, business leader, and entrepreneur are really inspiring. So ladies and uh, gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Diana Ramos. Thank you everyone so much. It's wonderful to see so many faces virtually. It was honestly a, a pleasure to be the person to give the commencement speech. I only wish I would have seen everyone in person. And I have to just reiterate and say congratulations on the wonderful accomplishment that you have achieved during this unprecedented time of the pandemic. You have done an amazing job, and I want to be one of the first ones to welcome you to the Mirage Alumni Network. This, as you see, is a fantastic place for all of us to gather, um, if anything, right now virtually, but hopefully in person, very, you know, in a, in a short while, so that we can all be able to network even even more and, and stay connected. I really, really want to emphasize the importance of staying connected not only as an alumni group, but more importantly in business. You all know, and we are all either students or alumni of the Mirage School, that networking is critical. Networking, whether it's um, meeting one person or being introduced by another person, all of those references are fantastic. So please remember, stay involved. Stay involved with the, the here, the, the Dean's Leadership Circle. And you know, it, it really is important to consider becoming a member of the De uh, Dean's Leadership Circle. So I would encourage you, all of you to join. And as a challenge, the simple ask for supporting the Dean's Leadership Circle is to donate $20 and 21 cents, something simple. Think about it like a dollar a day or a dollar and a half a, a day or so for, for, for one month. And I just wanted to share five ways to make sure that you stay connected, not only with each other, but as an alumni network. And that is visit often. And these virtual meetings actually make it easier for all of us to visit. I would love to hear where some folks are from because it always ends up being that there's some folks that are from across the country, around the world, and really through Zoom, it makes the world so much smaller. Um, also join or create a networking group and stay in touch with, with those friends that you met when you were during um, 
during your your studies at uh, UCI, never, never, never forget to mentor, to help those who are coming through, to encourage. I was so delighted. I got a text from a friend of mine yesterday. She's a physician, and she said, I got accepted to the EMBA program, and it was because I encouraged her to do it. So never stop encouraging others to pursue a higher education. And remember, think Mirage first. We are all a family. If there's somebody that is applying for a job, somebody you know, think Mirage first. You, you know the, the high quality of education that we all um, have undergone and keep in touch. Let us know your great achievements that you are continuing to, to, to do. And so with that, um, I wanna say cheers to everybody for outstanding work and a scan, outstanding accomplishment and welcome to the Dean's Leadership Circle. Great, thank you so much. That was really well done. Thank you, Dr. Ramos. And congratulations, class of 2021. Next, I'm really honored to introduce to you our panelists and moderators tonight. First up is Dr. Ming Leng. He is a associate professor at the Palm Raj School of Business and he studies careers, hiring and labor markets, and in particular issues pertaining to diversity and discrimination in the workforce. Dr. Lam would be able to share with us what he'll see, he's been seeing in the market in terms of trends, as well as what, to, what it took for him to transition personally. Uh, Manisha Dawan, founder and CEO of Empath Coaching, is a certified professional coach, a consultant, career strategist, and design thinking specialist. With over two decades of experience as a strategic partner to companies, Manisha has not only helped her clients navigate change, but she's made her own pivots as well, from consulting to Taco Bell, to now she's founded her own company, and she currently coaches people on exactly today's topic of transitioning in this pandemic. And our last panelist today is Jamie Veramontes. He's currently the Chief HR Officer at Forever 21, where he's focused on revitalizing and growing the brand's people and culture. Having made the career switch himself not too long ago, Almost uh, six months ago, Jamie will bring us perspectives of not only his personal transition, as well as some opportunities and challenges that he's seeing from the employer's perspective. And last but not least, we have the honor of having Alyssa Hilly today to be our moderator. She's a current Mirage student. And while pursuing her MBA at UCI, she transitioned from working at National Geographic Learning to an ed tech startup where she manages digital products and content creation. So Alyssa, thank you so much for being our moderator and I'm so excited for today's panel discussion. And uh, without further ado, let's get started. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you for those great introductions and thank you everyone for being here. Um, we have a great, set of panelists here to answer your questions. So just as a reminder, if you do have questions while we are um, going through the session, if you could just add them to the chat and we will get to them during the Q&A session. So we have a lot to get through today, so I'm gonna jump right in. Um, Professor Ming, I'm gonna start with you. Would you be able to please share some of the trends regard regarding transitioning careers? Sure. Yeah. No, thanks for having me, first of all. And I'm, I'm really happy to be speaking with this, this group of people on something that I am so interested in study as well. Uh, so I, let me let me talk a little bit about some of the trends I've been seeing. I think some of this has been going on uh, pre pandemic and some of it has been accelerated because of the pandemic. And I think these trends will hopefully kind of set the tone for some of the themes that that we'll be talking about. Um, the first thing, which is uh, why we're all here is talking about transitions. Um, one of the things that was going on before the pandemic, and I imagine the pandemic has accelerated, is the fact that people are transitioning in their careers much more than before. So a recent Bureau of Labor, Labor and Statistics survey has found that on average, people hold a job for about four years. 
And which means if you kind of do the math, on average, people have about 12 jobs in their lifetime. Um, this is of course, different depending on kind of where you are in your career stage. If you're under 24, for example, chance of you staying in a job beyond two years is almost nil. And so the, the point here is that everyone is transitioning a lot more nowadays. There's just a trend towards people looking for better jobs, moving around, moving geographically, which requires them to look for jobs. And so the fact that people are, are moving a lot more um, um, is, is, is makes transitioning and kind of job seeking that much more important. So that kind of sets the stage for what we're talking about today. The second trend that, that, that I've been kind of reading about and learning about, um, and it also has affected me personally, is a move more towards looking at the intrinsic um, uh, benefits that a job offers as opposed to the extrinsic ones. And so what I mean by that is a lot of times people think of a job as something where you go and get paid to do, right? And, and a job is just something that you have to deal with. But what's been going on more recently, and I think part of it is generational, um, but part of it also is pandemic, I think, um, um, induced, is the fact that people are realizing jobs are much more than just a paycheck. Jobs are also something where you find meaning and jobs are also something which um, provides you with the freedom or not to do, uh, to explore and kind of do what it is that you, you care about the most. And so this move towards looking for kind of a more ideal job in terms of it offering intrinsic benefits, job, you know, things that you kind of intrinsically care about, things that you, excite you, is another trend that I've been seeing a lot. Um, and again, this could be generational and it also could be pandemic kind of encouraged. The third trend, which I think we may touch on as well, and, and this is something which is certainly pandemic related, is the fact that people are starting to work a lot more and expecting to work a lot more virtually. And so whether that means you working a hybrid job or you working with teams that are kind of geographically spread apart, um, that has been accelerated as well. It's been going on since before the pandemic. And again, the pandemic has just kind of pushed us over the edge. And so I think thinking about coming out of this pandemic and, and, and looking for jobs, a lot of people may actually be thinking about it in terms of, well, kind of what kinds of, of uh, opportunities will I have either to work where I want to live, where I want to live and work at the same time, uh, or, or to work part-time in terms of being physically on, on, on site, or to have to work with virtual teams as well. Um, and so the technological kind of advances that we've seen and the technological kind of trends that we've seen has been pushing us towards that. Um, related to this, and, and this is a little bit as a, more of an aside is, um, I'm also seeing a lot more emphasis on people having kind of technical data skills. Now, it doesn't mean you have to learn how to program, right? But it, 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 what's going on now, at least some of the jobs that I've seen, the more, the, some of the desirable jobs I've seen, you're going to be required to like be comfortable with dealing with data, looking at data, doing analyses, recognizing what analyses mean. Um, and it's just because so many things now are being kind of technologically um, altered that data, even HR data is all available. Um, to be analyzed and, and, and cut apart and, 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 and um, dissected. And so um, I think having those skills may be valuable as well in a transition. So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I could go on for a long time about these topics, but I think that hopefully will set, set up enough uh, ideas and themes um, to talk about for the rest of the session. So but thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And we are going to be digging into some of those skills um, in a few questions here. Um, but I did want to take advantage of the great career stories that we currently have from some of the panelists, all of the panelists. And so I would really love to hear your experiences with this career transition and lessons learned, any challenges that you faced during that time. So Jamie, why don't we start with you? I'd be happy to. So uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, yeah, so I recently moved from uh, Chipotle a Mexican grill to um, Forever 21, where I now am for the past six months. And I would say the lessons learned for me were just really, um, you know, having a clear vision and having a real, a real clear uh, goal. Um, you know, you've, you've kind of heard through career coaching and development, you know, you, you're not going to get somewhere unless you know where you want to be. And so for myself, um, you know, I knew there were some certain things that I wanted for my career and that I wanted to make sure that, that I checked those boxes. So for example, for myself, I wanted to be part of a turnaround story. So Chipotle was a really great turnaround story. Um, there were a lot of great things that took place. 
Um, but I was actually the second in command while I was there. So a personal goal of mine was to get back into the head of HR role. And so I had a clear vision of that. And when this opportunity opened up, I thought, okay, head of HR and a turnaround story of, of a company that's going from bankruptcy through COVID, has a new CEO, and now is just off to the races. And um, I really want to be part of that story. Um, the second lesson I learned was be bold. And it's like, you know, I, can't, I couldn't be afraid. And, you know, it's scary when you're making a decision to make a move, um, especially when there's so much uncertainty in the industry. Um, but, you know, I always told myself, even when you're in a job and you're not making a change, you got to be bold and watch out for yourself because nobody else is really watching out for you in your career. So you got to own it. And so I, I knew that I needed to own my own career. And the third thing I would say is be persistent. And um, that's the other lesson I learned. And, you know, just because a door closes doesn't mean that another one's not going to open up again. And, you know, the, this Forever 21 role was not the first one that came up. Um, I was cherry picking. I wanted to make sure there were, um, you know, what I was going to go to next was going to be aligned with my goals. And, you know, it was a little bit scary. So going back to being bold, a little bit scary of, oh, if I say no to this job, is there going to be another one? Because not a lot of, of chief level roles open up in this, you know, Los Angeles, Orange County area. But, you know, just again, knowing my goal, um, being persistent, being bold, those things, if, if, I, if I stuck to those principles, um, then that was, that was like the, the um, silver lining, I guess, um, I would say, to make sure that I'm making the right choice. So that's what I'd say were my, were my lessons. That's great advice. Yeah. Manisha, would you like to take this one as well? Yeah, sure. Welcome, everyone. Congratulations to each of you. I'm super excited to be here. And I was in your shoes in 2009, right after the 2008 financial recession. Very different experience what you're going through right now, but also very scary and exciting time. So, uh, you know, Ming and Jamie hit some really important points. I think um, and by the way, I, I counted, and it, this is my seventh career, and I graduated in 09, so, and I think I have five more to go according to the statistics. Uh, and not all of it was planned, but, some of it, but most of it was intentional and purposeful. I was always seeking growth outside myself, not wanting to remain stagnant, being open to the possibilities. So I think the more flexible that you can be and the more resilient you are, and by the way, these are skills that employers are looking for, the more that can set you up for success. I think consulting, which was my first um, job out of Mirage at Deloitte, really kind of threw me into that um, sort of boot camp to be able to pivot industries, clients, projects, um, roll up my sleeves, try new things, not be afraid, that being bold mentality. And then also really understanding and getting to know myself what my strengths are, what my skills are, pushing my boundaries a little bit, because sometimes we don't even really know what our potential is until we step outside our comfort zone. So being, taking those calculated risks, seeking mentorship along the way, um, but trusting your intuition too, that will be your compass along your journey. I think it's very normal and natural to feel stuck at times. Uh, it's just a matter of how long you wanna stay stuck and remembering that you have a choice. So again, as we think about how the, the world is fluctuating and changing at such an accelerated pace, digital transformation has been going on for a while, but you know, the pandemic, global events, um, social injustice, these things are coming to the forefront and also coming um, as a priority for companies to really tackle and grasp with in terms of what kind of culture do they create to retain and attract employees. And now the market has shifted a little bit. There's a bit of a war for talent. So as candidates, you may also find yourself having an option to say, you know, maybe I want to work um, hybrid or remote uh, and, you know, be able to flex across different roles. Thinking also about the hybrid roles that I believe that in um, HR and Jamie, would love to maybe hear from you on this as well as thinking about planning these competencies and skills, what they're going to need to be digitally driven. That is the ability to be open to technology, to embrace change, not necessarily being very technical, but just being able to have that literacy around data, be, have that curiosity, be able to solve problems creatively, collaborate across virtual dispersed environments. These are the skills that are gonna set you apart and set you up for success. So I'm excited to be here again and I'm looking forward to your questions. Fantastic, thank you. And I do wanna dig into skills a little bit more. 
Um, I do want, I know that there is a lot of recent grads on this call. So I would love to hear some advice that you may have for recent grads or even people who are a little bit earlier on in their career. Ming, would you like to start this one? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, so as, as a professor here, you can imagine this is one of those, some of the questions I get a lot uh, in terms of thinking about how to, how to get a job coming out of school um, or how to think about jobs coming out of school. So I, I would say first, relax, <laughs> okay? No matter what job you end up getting, it's probably not going to be your last job, right? And so, so let's, just, let's just not worry about the everyone were, you know, gearing up to get their perfect job when they graduate or not, because it's, it's I can tell you, it's not gonna be your perfect job for lots of reasons, right? First, as, as we've talked about, the statistics are against you in terms of making it your, your final job. Uh, and, and second, you know, we what we think is our perfect job today is not necessarily our perfect job tomorrow. And so all this is to say, there's a lot of great jobs out there and how I think one way to think about them is, what is a good stepping stone, right? What job is going to kind of allow you to get the skills, get the connections, right? Get the experience that you may want or you may need kind of to make it to the next step. And so part of this, of course, is having an idea as to where you want to go. I'm not saying don't have an idea where you want to go. I'm just saying you may think you have an idea where you want to go, but that may change, right? But the point is the job that you should be looking for out of school, I think is one that will set you up for a learning opportunity. And just as Jamie and Manisha have been talking about, the point here is, right, there are skills you need and at different stages of your of your career. And so think about what is an ideal job that will allow you to get the skills that you may need, or maybe expose you to the industries that you may be interested in, or maybe you'll learn you don't like that industry, right? And, and exposure to that is also useful because you could say, you know, this job I had is, I, I would learn that it is not what I want to do. And, and so I think, a lot of times there's this panic as to, you know, the, the first, this job is going to make or break me, but I, I don't think that's the case. I think thinking about jobs as opportunities for you to learn, opportunities for you to meet people, um, opportunities for you to develop a, a set of skills, right, are, are, are ways, are also like a broader ways to look at jobs. And those, I think, are much, much more plentiful than kind of finding what you think is your perfect ideal job. So that, that's my, that's my uh, kind of plug for, for, for thinking about um, what you do when you get out of school. That's great. And Manisha, did you have something you'd like to add to that as well? Advice for recent grads? Yeah, beautifully said. I think it is about knowing that you don't have to have it all figured out. Really think about the experiences you want to chase, those learning opportunities, maybe an industry that you're interested in. Uh, I think as you're identifying your skills and strengths and doing that internal assessment, and really trying to uncover like, where have I been successful? What am I really good at? What are problems do people come to me for? When do I feel like I'm in the flow and the element? Those will give you clues and signals to maybe what directional you, directionally where you could go. But again, just being open to different possibilities. The jobs and the titles, those things are also flexing and evolving and changing and you're going to evolve and change. So the traditional roles might start to evolve people and culture versus HR, uh, you know, all these different hybrid roles. In addition to doing your internal assessment, I would also recommend looking at the marketplace and seeing what trends, you know, Ming pointed out some great ones, but what are companies really struggling with? What are your target companies uh, really faced with today? And how can you come in and potentially help them solve those problems and address those gaps? And if there's still some, you know, opportunities for growth, try to seek that out and invest in yourself. As Jamie was saying, you know, don't wait for somebody to invest in you. If you can maybe take some courses or are you just completing an MBA? So not, it doesn't have to be a whole full-fledged degree, but even like a two-day, two-week micro-learning, doing some research and getting up to speed can help you have those uh, meaningful conversations when you are networking and putting yourself out there. Great, thank you. And we've all, everyone's been touching upon these skills and these skills that you're hoping to gain at an earlier stage in your career um, to help your career progression. So moving forward now, coming out of the pandemic, what skills are useful to have? And have you been seeing any new skills? I know digital transformation was mentioned, technical data skills, collaboration, things like that. Are there skills that you are now seeing more of a trend or more um, from an hi a hiring perspective? Uh, Jamie, would you like to start? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I would say two come to mind immediately. Um, one is adaptability. 
and the other one would be the ability to work independently, interestingly, right? So if you're if you think about um, a hybrid model, you're at home a lot by yourself. And while you can get together and work as teams, you're going to be working without somebody um, over your head as you would in an office with your boss right there working with you. So you're going to have to manage yourself and you can't be afraid to manage yourself. And so what we're, we look for is who's someone that can be that self-starter, someone who can really manage themselves and make sure they're hitting their goals. Adaptability, things are changing so fast. And you know we, we talk about the new normal all the time. I mean, that in itself, you have to adapt to that. So the fact that we're having this conversation about the pandemic and about how you navigate, you know, um, so many things have changed. And so it's uh, just like, um, you know, Ming was saying, Manisha was saying about, you know, you gotta, you can't be afraid of these changes. You can't be afraid to start with one thing and then switch to another. When they were speaking, I was thinking about my first job. I worked for Chase in HR. And I think I counted like 12 different bosses that I had because I transitioned from one department to another department to another department. Some were my own choices, but others were because the business was changing so quickly. So those would be the, two, the top two that come to mind. Great, thank you. Manisha, did you have any other skills you wanted to add? Yeah, those are great. And this is what I hear as well from some of my corporate clients that they're looking for as they're recruiting, just like Jamie mentioned, that flexibility, adaptability to change, how receptive you are to change. If you're more resistant, then that you could potentially be left behind. Um, how resilient you are in the face of change. Can you bounce back and recover from setbacks effectively? And the agility piece, you know, being able to flex and um, adapt. Another key thing, especially now in this like hybrid virtual is your communication skills. Can you be an, an effective listener? Can you empathize? And can you create those connections and that influence in a virtual hybrid setting? And that takes a lot of, again, self-awareness of your own emotions, your own triggers, being able to manage them, and then really just listening and meeting people where they are and showing up authentically. That's great advice for at any point in your career, that's great. So as we mentioned, there are a lot of recent grads um, on this call, but there's also people who are a little bit further in their careers. So if you've been in a role for a while, what should you know about trying to make that transition and how to kind of set that narrative for yourself? Ming, would you like to start this one? Sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely share a question, right? We started with talking about how everyone's moving and, and this whole uh, point of this um, uh, um, panel session is about transitions. And, and yet we, we don't wanna forget that, you know, people may be transitioning from a place where they've been for a while. And so, so I think thinking a little bit about the challenges of moving basically after you've been in one place for a long time is, is, is something that is important as well. Um, I think what I've been, so I do study, as I said, I do study transitions and there are people that make transitions after a long time. I think the challenges are that you um, may not have as obvious of a trajectory um, um, to, to demonstrate kind of progress. And so usually because of all these transitions you see in, in the labor market, people are also looking at your resume in terms of, you know, what are the jobs you've taken and, and what are the kinds of sequence you've taken them? And does this look like something that you're headed towards, right? And if you don't have a lot of those moves, if you just have one job where you've been there for five, seven, eight years, then people may, may be concerned that you aren't kind of um, um, working towards something or it's hard to convince someone you're working towards something. So I think uh, the challenge with, with, of, of someone, you know, being in one place for a long time is, is that, you know, they don't have kind of that, that movement that demonstrates they're ready or they're or looking for the next thing. Um, that's one obvious challenge. The other is, of course, the fact that your skills may have atrophied, right? The point uh, as what Manisha and Jamie are talking about is, you know, the skills change and what people are looking for change. And if, and if you can't kind of demonstrate that, um, there's a risk that you may not look like you have the right skills. And so, I mean, I can set up the questions and the risks. Um, I think Manisha or, or Jamie may be better positioned to think about how to kind of address those. So. Absolutely, Manisha, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, sure. And uh, you know, I've, I come across this a lot as well and just people that have stayed in the career for a really long time for a variety of reasons. Maybe they started when pension was available or they feel very comfortable. Um, you know, they have a good schedule. They have a good relationship with their teams and change can be scary and hard no matter 
how how recent it is or you know how long you've been in a role or if you're just graduating and starting something new so i think the key is again to bridge that story get comfortable with that sort of elevator pitch when you introduce yourself that you're connecting where you are today to looking forward where you're headed and why and even if you've been in the same role for a long time, you could maybe try to tease out and find ways that you have progressed. Maybe you've taken on additional scope or responsibility or your role has pivoted slightly. Uh, you know, you were an individual contributor and maybe you were uh, now in a cross-functional team working with a, you know, a group of stakeholders. So find those success stories, maybe like three of them, practice speaking them out loud and really look for those transferable skills. If you're looking at a job description, for example, and, they, and you're coming from um, an operations role and you wanna move into project management, there's probably some ties and connections you can make if you have led a project or if you have been a facilitator or liaised between team members, you were responsible for a timeline or you know, um, managing a budget. It's again about pulling those threads out of your current experience, bridging the gap and telling that story, but it is very, very possible to make that switch. I've seen it happen successfully uh, and, and be patient with yourself because it, it's, it, it might feel like, you know, you're just moving slowly and be patient, be compassionate. And again, just seek some of that cell, some of those answers within, do some soul searching. Why do you want to make that change? And when you talk to a recruiter or hiring manager, this is what I've done. Here's where I've been. Here's how I can add value to your organization. And now you're really speaking in their language in terms of what they need, their pain points, and, and moving the story forward instead of in the past, if that makes sense. Absolutely. That's great. And I think we hear a lot about this bridging the story and, you know, from no matter where you are in your career, whether you're early on or you're further along and you're just trying to make a pivot, it's about how do you bridge the story from where you are and where you're heading? Jamie, do you want to add on to that? Yeah, so much, uh, so many jewels have been said already, gems, I should say. Um, I would add that, you know, don't be, going back to what we said earlier, don't be afraid to use your network because if you've been somewhere for a while, you've, you've established a lot of really great relationships. People know you really well. People are probably come and gone. Stay connected with those people because they're probably landed in other places and they can help you get to that next place. The second thing I'd say is be bold on your resume because that's gonna be your tool to get the attention of the recruiter that's recruiting for the role that you want. And make sure that you're succinct in terms of what you've done um, and talk about your accomplishments, but think ahead of, you know what, if they, I'm, I'm probably facing, um, you know, the fact that I've been here for a while. So what are those people going to be asking me and wanting to see in my resume that stand out? And then once you land the interview, make sure you're bold again with when, when you're talking and giving your answers, give those clear examples of how you're thinking outside the box and how you're resilient, how you're adaptable, how you can change, because that's going to help you get that much further. That's great, thank you. So we've been sharing a lot of you know, advice on how to move forward, but there's definitely has to be some pitfalls and some traps that people fall into when trying to make this career transition. So Manisha, can you um, discuss that a little bit? Yes, lots of pitfalls to watch for. One is you start to doubt yourself and lose that self-confidence. Uh, so just be mindful of the self-talk uh, that you're doing, those, you know, that inner dialogue that we have. And um, another thing is, you know, 70% of the jobs are a lot of times through the network, through those connections. So go through your existing connections, set up those informational chats, let people know, you know, what you're looking for and also be proactive and say, here's how I can help too. So some people give up on networking a little bit early because they don't see results right away. I actually got two of my jobs through LinkedIn and so you wanna make sure your profile is up to date. You're putting yourself forward in your best light. Uh, you're you're um, continuing to cultivate those relationships and that, those networks. It could happen. For example, I applied to a job, never heard anything. A year later, I talked to somebody. This was the Taco Bell position, actually. I got it through. I ended up go, getting to, through Taco Bell through Slalom Consulting. So it didn't exactly happen the way I planned. So being open to um, the journey and not necessarily getting fixated on, you know, I need to have this job or this title. Um, I thought I might 
be a partner at Deloitte. And then when I got in there and realized what that entailed, um, I exited and, and made other plans for myself. So you're going to learn a lot. Adopt that mindset of continual learning and reframe failure. If you're not going to make it to a certain level or a certain title, success is something that you get to define for yourself. That's great. Thank you. Jamie, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I'm actually thinking of what more I can add that's even better. And you know what? Manisha did sum it up very time, well. Manisha just did so well. So tough, to, yeah. tough act to follow over here. Tough to follow. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to reiterate what she said, what Manisha said. <laughs> Great. So actually, Jamie, while we have you, um, obviously the pandemic has impacted the recruiting landscape in many, many ways um, yeah, absolutely. that we've already touched upon in terms of being remote and hybrid and what's that going to look like? So in, from your perspective, how has the pandemic impacted the recruiting landscape? It, you know, we, we were talking about this uh, the other day and I would say that it's totally a buyer's market right now. Um, in other words, it's a candidate's market. Um, there are so many opportunities uh, for people looking for roles. Um, and unfortunately for the employer side, we're seeing so much turnover um, in the, you know, people who have been with the company for, you know, 10, 15 years, or even six months or, or a year, they're just wanting to make a transition. Um, we're also seeing a lot of competition with competing offers. So we go to make offers and we're up against somebody that has two or three other offers. And so, um, you know, that means it's, again, it's the candidate's market, but, you know, kind of think about that as a candidate, what does that mean for you? That means that there are other candidates competing with you because, you know, even though it is a, a candidate's market, you know, people are talking to multiple people as well. So you're going to still want to be bold and not be, um, you know, not, not, not be too laid back, stay in control of what you want. Um, but on the flip side of that, there's a balance. You can still be picky, right? Because what I just said means that you have options. So again, there's that balance, um, but you want to, you want to land the role that you want to land. So it's, it's okay to be specific about what you want, specific about where you want to go and really go after it. So, you know, I would say that the landscape is one of um, opportunity. It's one for people to go and um, try something probably different than they hadn't tried before. Um, there are, we, we were saying a bit earlier about the hybrid model. Uh, companies like Forever 21, you've, you've read the, the headlines about Apple and all those big companies that are just trying, they're struggling with, what do we do? Two days a week, three days a week, 100% remote, what do we do? And so, um, you know, there, there are companies making bold statements. And so that's changing how we operate. That's changing how we have, um, how, like, how do you build culture? How do you maintain the culture that you want? Um, and so all that goes into when, you, when you're going to interview for a job, the employer is interviewing for, are you a cultural fit? So that too is impacting the recruiting landscape because we're having to figure out how do we read that over an interview over the, the web, right? So I've I actually personally been at uh, Forever 21 for six months, like I talked about. I've only been to headquarters twice. I report to the CEO. I've only met him once in person. I've had, I've had a complete six month relationship even with my own CEO who I report to. So it's definitely different. Um, and it's okay to have those kind of relationships, but it's just, it is different. Um, so again, be bold, know what you want, be persistent. That's great. Manisha, do you have anything you'd like to add in terms of what you've seen from the recruiting landscape? Yeah, I mean, Jamie touched upon some great points. I think companies are trying to figure it out too and build the plane as we fly. What does return to work look like? How do we sustain and propagate a culture across you know, multiple countries, geographies? How do we onboard and retain our talent and, and create that experience and drive that employee experience that makes people want to stay? Uh, and those that are staying, how do we keep them engaged? In, with the culture and, and with our values? So they're having to potentially increase touch points 
um, with, with their teams and their managers. Be creative in terms of the collaboration, um, not just the actual activities, but the tools that they're gonna use. I think we're gonna start to see more asynchronous communication and ways to keep a, a, in touch with what's happening within companies through chat, video, you know, bots, um, uh, sensors. I mean, all kinds of new technology is gonna come out that's gonna amplify what we're seeing in Zoom to help you know, replicate those in-person meetings. So I think being proactive about that from your perspective, you know, really trying to understand how you can remain visible, how you can remain engaged. Um, you know, if you're on a project, again, network with everybody on the team, try to expand that network outward, look for opportunities where you can showcase your skills. And uh, yeah, from a company perspective, I think it, it is, it, it really is something that they're trying to address is now it's competitive, you know, Facebook and the Twitters of the world, permanent, indefinite remote work from home, but not every company can do that. So is there a hybrid or flexibility? What are the benefits that companies can really offer? Wellness programs, you know, with mental wellness, that's another incentive. Um, so think about your values, what's important to you and what you're seeing the company do in terms of how they're driving the employee experience and where there could be some alignment and, and resonance to think about you know, your future. Thank you. And there have been a lot of discussions around this re retaining employees, especially employees who have been remote, which most of us have been. So how, what is that gonna look like going forward? Are employees going to be expecting that this is part of their package? Are they expecting to have this flexible work from home option, a hybrid model? What, it, what does that look like for you? Jamie, would you like to start? Yeah, this is, uh, you know, kind of continuing what I was saying a bit ago, we're losing people a lot. So, you know, obviously I don't have the answer yet, but I'll tell you what my, my, my early um, learnings are. Um, we're finding that when people are leaving, they're saying that they want flexibility and that they're leaving for more money. And it's, it's a different than what we've heard in the past. In the past, it's been, oh, because mainly because of my relationship with my leader or lack thereof. So I think that still exists, but I think that um, what we're hearing in exits and what we're hearing from stay interviews is, you know, having that flexibility that we've had for the past year plus of being able to be home with your family and um, have the flexibility of, you know, going to my kid's soccer game and do whatever you need to do without having to spend, you know, an hour one way, you know, each way, two hours in the car, um, they want that. And that's, that has risen to the top in terms of the importance level. So for companies that aren't doing that, you're starting to lose that. And, and, and people are going more towards that, that place of um, 100% remote or even more remote than you are. If I'm three days, I'm going somewhere that's two days instead. Um, so I think that the lesson for, for me right now has been um, to listen to our employees, make sure that we're very much in sync to what they're telling me. Right. And we got it. We got to get rid of the old school thinking of everyone's got to be in the office, as an example. Um, and we got to think outside the box. And two is people still want to have that connection. Right. Even though they want remote, they still want to have a relationship with their leader. They still want to grow. They still want that career growth. And so we got to find a way to keep that, um, you know, front, front and center so that our people are growing and having the flexibility that they want. So very interesting time. Absolutely. Thank you. Manisha, do you have something you'd like to add? Yeah, that's great, Jamie. I think, yeah, the co-creating with the employee, can you involve them in the conversation and, and get their feedback in a continuous loop so that you're keeping abreast of what's really important? What do our employees really care about? And it really sometimes also depends on the role. I've seen companies where they've returned full-time in person. If they're manufacturing, um, if you're in R&D, if you're doing IT infrastructure and your role requires you to be on site, you may not necessarily have an option, in which case you have to... Um, ask those difficult questions. Is that something you want to do long-term or can you afford to, or do you need to relocate? And I think for other com you know, companies, again, I think there's some experimentation. Is it the Monday, Wednesday, every other Friday? Is it the Monday, Tuesday to keep people in the office consecutively? Um, should we add a collaboration day once a week? So I think that, that might even evolve over time a little bit. Um, so again, it, the more open and flexible that you can be, as companies are also flexing through this stage and, and learning, I think then that will also set you up for success and, and provide more options for you as well. Uh, you know, I, I think Jamie hit on some really great points in terms of 
what does this mean for the overall culture? How do we stay engaged and connected? And, and if you're onboarding right now, you're, you may never actually meet your team in person for a while. So uh, what can you do to show up as your best self and prepare for the role, uh, make an effort to get to know your colleagues, maybe even try doing something offsite for those who can attend and build those moments that matter. So every time you're showing up, you're creating a moment that matters and you're connecting with somebody. So that I would just encourage you to think about that as you're starting your new venture. Adventure <laughs> or venture. That's great. That's great advice to you, a moment that matters. I like that. This actually really flows well into um, a question we got from one of the guests about our surrounding company culture. So we were just hearing some perspectives from the employer. Now from an, a perspective from the candidate is how, how can you best gauge a company's culture if all the interviews are remote and if the workforce itself is also remote? Jamie, would you like to start on that one? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would ask the question, 100%. Ask the question while you're having interviews. Um, and by the way, don't be afraid to request interviews. When you're, when you're being interviewed, you're also interviewing the company. So I love it when somebody comes to me and says, you know what, I've thought through this role. In order for me to be successful, I would love to meet the chief operating officer or the, you know, the director of ops or whatever to gain their perspective. And when you get with those people, ask them, how would you describe the culture? What are things like? What are the, what's leadership like? You know, be very pointed about it and then compare the answers that you get as you're meeting with two or three or four different people and see what consistencies you gather and inconsistencies. And that's gonna tell you something as to what the culture is all about. I think also just pay attention to, you know, what your experience is all about, um, you know, as you're going through like like you normally would, right? So employers that are focused on a candidate, a good candidate experience, they're gonna be honed in on making sure you have a great employee experience as well. And so that's gonna give you a good tip into what, what to expect. And then I think the third thing would probably be um, what kind of offerings they're thinking through. Are they, are they innovative? Are they cutting edge? Are they thinking ahead? Are they in tune with what's happening today? And um, that's gonna help you determine, you know, is it also cutting edge company, thinking, thinking ahead, progressive type company? It's gonna give you some foresight into that. That's great, thank you. Manisha, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? This is such a great question because I think, you know, with culture, there's so many subcultures too within organizations. So you might get a have a be on a team where your culture is completely different from your colleagues' subculture. Um, I, you know, Jamie hit some great notes there. I think it's worthwhile asking the question during interviews as you're networking too, and um, you know, being involved, finding people that work there, having those virtual coffees, saying, "I'd love to hear." more about your role, how you've been successful, what advice you might have for somebody like me, and listen for also what's in between the lines. Sometimes the questions that you can also ask are things like, uh, you know, how, how, does, how does conflict get resolved on the team? Or what does inclusion and DEI look like? You know, also trying to um, get to culture by asking those sorts of questions that um, could could give some more uh, color, some more light, uh, shed, some more, shed some more light in terms of those, aside from what's on the brochure and on the website, you know, we're a culture that values inclusion and um, being human and transparency, you know, to really get to the heart of the culture, it does take some, a lot of research. I will also say the pitfall here is to take things with a grain of salt. Some people might be jaded or at a different point in their career and their perspective um, might be, you know, shadowed by their experience. So you want to also keep that in mind that some, where somebody else's lens could be very different from yours. You could actually be very successful there. So take things with a grain of salt, do as much, much research in terms of first and second hand, um, you know, even going to like their social media platforms, what is the brand perception they're putting out uh, in terms of how they're valuing their employees, their vendors, uh, you know, in Chipotle's case, like the relationship they have with the farmers and the farming community. This tells a lot about what what they're doing in terms of their culture and how they are investing in their people. Um, and, and again, and, and you're, if you're onboarding virtually, it might take some time to get the nuances, nuances of the culture, but also you have the opportunity to help create that just by being there and adding value. That's great advice, thank you. Ming, did you have anything you'd like to add to that? 
Uh, no, I think they hit on, I think Jamie and Manisha hit on exactly the, the, the right points. I think I'd like to emphasize the idea of, um, uh, of, of, of networking and kind of ask, finding people that work there to tell you a little bit about their, their culture and their experiences. I think that I don't want to, I, I want to make sure that one's underscored because I think the, that's incredibly valuable. I think firms may talk about their culture on their websites and their annual reports and, and, and then have a very very different kind of actual lived experience when they when people work there. And so I think be, um, being able to kind of get the insider story about that is, is, is incredibly valuable. And that, that, what that does is allows you to kind of be more compelling when you, when you meet with recruiters, when you meet with, when you interview, um, because you can be forthcoming with, you know, your, your uh, vivid and compelling stories that, that match with what they're looking for and that, and, and having that and being armed, you know, forearmed with that is, is incredibly valuable, I think. So just want to underscore that. Absolutely. That's a great point. We have a few more questions from guests, so I will go through these. Um, one of these, we, we touched on this a little bit at the beginning, but um, Ming, it would be great if you could elaborate on this a little bit. Importance of first job out of college and securing that perfect, perfect first job. What if that's not possible? What if that is not, you know, what is available at the moment? What should we prioritize? Yeah, no, that's that's incredibly. It's very reasonable. Like I said, first off, um, I, you know, I I I I thought I had a perfect first job, which I was lucky enough to get, and you know, I that was you know eight jobs ago or something like that, and and a totally different industry ago. So so um, I I, I, I want to make sure we come back and make and we understand that that point. But so I I, I think so again, think of, thinking of your first job as a stepping stone uh, allows you to kind of take the advice that Manisha and Jamie and, and I have been kind of talking about and thinking about what it is, which job will allow you to get kind of the skills, the um, exposure, the, um, the learning that you, you need, right? To set you up for your second and possibly third, et cetera, job, right? And so in that sense, I'll say it's not necessarily about brand name. It's not necessarily about um, um, pay. Right, because you could give those up and get a much better learning experience and the much much better opportunities. And so, let's let's try and be kind of more um, holistic about thinking about what you get out of your first job and not focus on just what is the highest salary or what is the you know the sexiest company, but instead you know what job is going to allow me the opportunity to learn the most, you know, um, ex be exposed to the most, um, maybe again learn about what I don't like as much as what I like. Right, and and those I think you'll be surprised are very valuable lessons that you're not necessarily going to get just because you go for, you know, the high salary or the high kind of prestige job. So, I, I mean, I, I can't emphasize that enough just because my experiences have been, you know, I thought I got my dream job, but like I said, that was eight jobs and two de degrees ago, right? And, and two industries ago, right? So, so there, there's, there's no, um, there's no loss in thinking about it kind of holistically. What am I getting besides just, right, a high salary? So, so that I think that, but that's one way of thinking of it. Yeah, that, that's a great perspective. Manisha, would you like to add to that as well? Yeah, sure. And Ming, you said it so well. Don't chase titles, chase experiences. Uh, my first job out of college, actually, I was working for my dad in our family business. And uh, in fact, my parents said, you should come home and work for your dad because I wasn't able to really find anything at that time. And at the, you know, I kind of was a little bit hesitant about it, but I was able to dive in and I said, okay, I'm going to learn about operations, finance, manufacturing, and had so much wealth of experience. And that's what actually led me to my next role. So think of these as those stepping stones that's along your journey and think of your career as the bigger picture holistically that, you know, it may not be the straight era might be more like up and down, but eventually moving in a direction that you want. Um, so having a sense of what you want, being intentional, purposeful, proactive, but again, open and flexible. And once you're there at the job, let's say it's not your dream role, make the most of it anyway. Network, build those relationships, and you can continue to look and see what, what else is out there. But what are you meant to learn and, and get from this opportunity? And I guarantee you'll find something, um, even if it's just going to last six months or a year. And remember, again, it's likely going to change. I moved from operations to HR to IT to consulting. And I think, you know, <laughs> I think in a way that that will open some doors for you if you just 
just be open to the possibilities. Um, the titles and the accolades and, and the salary, that will come, you know, um, that will eventually come. So don't feel all that pressure. Don't put so much pressure on yourself to have it right out of the gate. Really think again about how can you maximize yourself in, in wherever you wherever you do land. And then that use that as a platform and a shooting off point to go wherever you want to go next. Great advice. That's great. Um, I have one more question from uh, the guest. How have you leveraged your network to transition and advance in your careers? This is a great question. Jamie, why don't we start with you on this one? My network has been everything, like <laughs> quite honestly. You know, it's, I don't, I think back to what, what did we do before LinkedIn? Oh my gosh, you know, I guess um, you just had to keep the contacts that were in your phone and, you know, make sure you went to, to lunches and did everything. But now, I mean, we just have such a powerhouse with something like LinkedIn to be able to keep that network. But um, I've leveraged it for every job that I can think back to. And I've been in HR now for 25 years. Um, I thought I thought I was going to be a civil engineer. My first job was in HR, and that completely switched and changed my whole philosophy. So that's just a good example of you never know what you're going to walk into and what you're going to end up doing. And so um, every career every career move that I've made in the past 25 years has been because I knew somebody. Either my boss was bringing me along with them, a colleague of mine told me about a job, I got a referral. I, I was targeting the company and I, I looked into my network and tried to figure it out. So I would say 100% of the time, my transitions have been because of my network. So keep in touch with them. Um, don't be afraid to, to uh, reach out. And I was actually nervous a few times reaching out to some people that I used that I would be like, oh, they're not gonna wanna talk to me. They're not gonna wanna help me. People are flattered to wanna help the majority of the time at least the ones you want in your network. <laughs> They're flattered to want to help you and to encourage you and help you grow. So don't be afraid to use them. That's great advice to really utilize that network. And yeah, yeah. don't be timid, which I'm sure yeah. we've all felt at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Manisha, do you have anything you'd like to add to that one? Yeah, networking, I mean, it never really stops. Even if you're, even when you're employed, you want to continue to build your network uh, and, and make it Again, make it work for you. It doesn't have to feel like transactional, like a chore. Maybe you set a goal. I'm going to have five, you know, five coffee chats this week. Uh, for me personally, my Mirage alumni network. I mean, I, I, I basically landed at Deloitte through Mirage. It was uh, through Mirage recruiting, so that was huge. And just staying in touch with people um, after that, going. And, and all my other positions and jobs, again, um, you don't have to have it all figured out and you can pivot at any time. Um, eventually, even with my own business, my network is extremely important when I wanna make connections, do things like this. This came from networking, this opportunity right here with you guys today. So uh, you'll, you never know, you never know where it might take you. It may lead to a friendship. It could be a mentorship. Maybe you become the mentor and you set somebody else up for success or tell them the words that they need to hear. So have fun with it. And um, yeah, you might be surprised the relationships that you uncover, the friendships uh, and, and go in without any expectations, but go in prepared, you know, respect people's time. And you, people are willing to make those low commitment, you know, 15 minute, love to jump on a call with you uh, just to get to know you better and introduce myself. And people are more open than you think. So if, some, if you're facing rejection, don't take it personally. It could be that they're genuinely busy. Uh, and just keep going, keep being resilient. That's great advice. Thank you. Ming, do you have any, anything you'd like to add on to that? Sure, just a little, a, a little bit. I think what Jamie mentioned about the uh, hesitation and when you mentioned about the hesitation people have about kind of using, I'll put that in quotes, right? Using their network. I, that is not how we should be thinking about it, right? You reaching out to your network is also a chance for that person you're reaching out to right, to have an opportunity, right? Whether it, it could be to, because they're looking for someone or know someone that's looking for someone um, for a certain position, for example, uh, that person's doing that other person a favor by you reaching out, you know, you reaching out to them is allowing them to do a favor for someone else, right? So I, I wanna make sure we think about networking as it's, it, it, there's lots of opportunities for, for what we call win-wins. It's not just you bugging someone or you, right, asking for favors all the time. That, that's not the right way kind of to approach it. It should be a very positive approach approach mentality, not an avoid mentality where, where 
you know, you're looking for a job. That's an opportunity for someone to give you a job, right? That's an opportunity for someone to play, to fill a position. Um, and that's just one example. There are infinite examples of how people, right, should reach out and, and, and because they heard about something, because they've heard about an opportunity, because they, right, have a, they learned something about some company that could be useful to someone else. There's lots of kind of different ways that you could um, increase the value of your network of your whole network, right? By, by you kind of sharing information, it, um, it, it makes all of your, for example, your Mirage network stronger, right? And so I think I can't emphasize this enough. I know Alyssa, you, you were in my class and I'm sure you, you, Jamie and Manisha have had similar classes where like that professors always talking about networks, 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 but it's it's a real thing. <laughs> it, 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 that's why Mirage is so strong, right? That's why um, all of us are where we are. It's because of who we know and, and so, don't be shy to, to kind of to use it. And that's I, I, I that's the, the hesitation is what I hear a lot of students have. And that's what I want to push you for. I think we all get that networks matter, but I think you got to get over that, that, that hesitation. So I just want to encourage you guys more. No, that's a great point. And from as a student, I feel that hesitation too. So that is all very, very valuable advice. And we have one other comment here from the chat. Um, let me just read this out. Certain companies are still behaving as though the candidate experience is unimportant. For example, many companies are holding interviews where the expectation is that the candidate have a camera on while the internal recruiter or hiring manager has their camera off. From the candidate's perspective, this speaks volumes about the company. Would you agree? So I'm not sure if you've experienced this at all in, in interviewing. Uh, Jamie, I'm, do you have any experience with, with this? Yeah, I think the question kind of answered the question in a bit because <laughs> it's, it's very telling. You're, you're mm -hmm. getting a, a, a preview of what the culture is. And I would, I would bet that uh, you know, if, you were to, if you were to join that company, um, you would probably experience the same thing when you're in meetings and um, and you know because because there has been no expectation set of that person that's that's um, you know interviewing. So I think that's take that as with a grain of salt, but as another data point in your interview process that you know this is what this was your experience. You know a little bit though on the employer side, I'm, I'm going to go into a little bit of defensive mode, but not too much. I shouldn't use that word, but. Um, you know, there's there there are a lot of things hitting employers right now that they're really trying to navigate through, like we talked about earlier, um, because you know we're employers are not ready for this. They have not been ready for this, so they're dealing with. I know for myself, I'm dealing with technology turnover on my own team, I'm trying to trying to figure out what the values are going to be, what the new culture is going to be, and so they are they're human beings as well on 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 the inside, and so you know take that's why I mean take it with a grain of salt. Um, and just use that as a way to evaluate. That's great. Great that you can answer from both sides. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I'll open up the floor now if anyone has any questions they would like to ask any of the panelists. Yeah, so that was actually my question. Oh, thank came from, you. from me. This is Clara. Uh, I actually work at UCI and I'm the executive coach for the executive MBA students. I get the privilege of working with some of the, the brightest and I see some of the students actually on this call. And so it's not my own experience, but this is, this is a trend. I'm hearing this repeatedly from Fortune 200 companies who are using this method of interviewing people and it's very disconcerting. Um, so that's why I was really curious is, are you seeing this? Are you hearing this? And how does a candidate deal with a situation where they're literally being put on stage and asked to perform? That's what it feels like. So I'm speaking up on their behalf. Thank you, no, it's, yeah, it's, it's a great point. Yeah. This, this makes me want to add, this is a, such a great point. So thank you for adding that question. I would say that um, one of the things I know from Forever 21, what we're, we're saying is we are setting the expectation that when you're in a meeting on both sides, that we all have our cameras on, especially if we're going to be going to this commitment of a hybrid model where we're committing to three days in the office, two days out of the office. What does that mean? What are, what are the ways that we're going to cope with that? If you went to a meeting, you wouldn't be hiding behind somebody. You know, you'd, you'd be expected to be out there in the open with everybody else. And so 
um, that's an expectation that we're setting. And, um, you know, I hope that other companies are, are going to do the same thing. Cause I, I agree with you. It's uh, it's awkward. It's, it's strange. And I don't believe in putting candidates up on the, you know, in the firing range, if you would, <laughs> it's not a good experience. Yeah. It's hard to coach people to prepare for something like that because yeah. it's all about wanting to make a connection, a human connection. And we're already in a, you know, a, a two dimensional world. We're, we're robbed of the three dimensional world because most interviews are happening this way. So yeah. I just find it, I find it interesting, but thank you so much for, uh, for commenting on that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would just add to that, you know, I've had a couple meetings where I come on camera and the person's not on camera and, and I actually ask them, I say, you know, do you prefer to remain off camera and we could turn off our videos if that's more comfortable? I kind of make a joke of it. Like I know it's, we're all having Zoom fatigue. And so, um, but that way the playing field is a little bit evened out. But of course, when you're in the inter interviewee, uh, that can be a little bit of a challenge. So just showing up as your best self, but also kind of filing that away as that was a candidate experience. I do think there's a lot that can be reimagined and reinvented when it comes to recruiting. There are some, you know, practices that are a little bit, um, outdated, but again, every company is um, doing it a little bit differently. So I'm surprised to hear that. I think it's just, uh, it could also be a personal preference of the recruiter or the hiring manager doing the interview and maybe the company isn't aware of that practice. Uh, but yes, it's, it's definitely, the candidate is in the driver's seat in terms of how they want to uh, perceive that and actually take that in and say, you know what, is this a place I really wanna work? Is it something, do I give them the benefit of the doubt? Um, and do I maybe politely call them out on it? Thank you for that perspective and input. Great, are there any other questions? We are approaching time. Uh, so I will hand it back over to Laura to wrap us up. Great, thank you so much, Alyssa. And thank you to all the pan panelists, Manisha, Ming, and Jamie for all of your wonderful insights. I wrote down a lot of good notes, even for myself. Um, and, you know, being flexible, being a self-starter, and being resilient. These are ways of being that's gonna help us throughout the pandemic and post-pandemic, whether you're job searching or not, whether you're transitioning or not. So thank you so much. And I will be sharing some more of these pearls on LinkedIn and tagging you uh, tomorrow. So, um, and then I would like to make some announcements to uh, share with all of you the upcoming events that uh, Sandy would like to highlight for all of the alumni. So first of all, we have an event from the BL Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Uh, coming up in about three weeks, uh, how to identify and navigate federal funding opportunities. And also feel free to uh, bookmark these two pages, Mirage Events Calendar and UCI Alumni Events, so that you can get the most updated information on there. Also, I'd like to share with you the social media links for uh, staying in touch with the Mirage School the alumni group and the DLC. So um, Jasmine will be chatting the links to uh, the chat box on the bottom. So feel free to whichever group you're interested in joining, uh, click on those and stay in touch with us. And thank you everyone for attending today because this is our com alumni community and together we can be really strong and we're gonna propel the Mirage School forward. Um, Jasmine also chatted in the feedback survey down at the chat box. So with these events, Sandy, Yvette, and Jasmine already do a really good job, but they know that there's always room to improve. So that's why we really, really value your feedback to really help us uh, improve these events further. And then whatever worked really well, please do share those with us as well. So um, thank you so much, everybody.